My boy Levi, what's going on, man? All right, I see you, Mark. Let me get you in. The wonders of technology, brother. I know. <laughs> I have my wife here helping me out. Okay. Okay. I know my wife will be tuning in, too. <laughs> All right. Cool. <clears throat> I see my mom just joined too. My dukes in the in the house, huh? Yep. Yep. <laughs> That's good, brother. That's good. Oh yeah. Looks like we have uh we're gonna have a nice little nice little session here, man. I'm 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 happy about that. Yeah, me too. I'm excited about it too. I'm excited. Good, good. So Wait a couple of minutes, man. See who comes in. Okay. And then we should just jump into it, man. And whoever joins in the the, yep. the, the fray, yeah, they will they will be welcomed. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely, brother. Yeah. So you're in Atlanta, right? I'm in Atlanta. Yep, in Atlanta. As you know, man, I'm out here in sunny California. Yep, I know you out there in Cali. <laughs> My mother <laughs> said it was. She's in New York, and so. She uh -huh. said to me, uh, it's freezing out here. I said, oh, it's pretty cold out here, too, but it's like 63 degrees. <laughs> oh, man, it's colder here. I, I, it's rainy, too. I think today we are down at least in the 50s. Okay. Oh, yeah. And it'll probably get colder later on, too. So. Yeah, it's, these things do happen, brother. These things uh, do happen. But the All right, brother, you want, you want to jump into it, man, so we can get this action going? Yeah, let's go ahead and get it going. Let's go ahead and get it going so we can um, start off. Uh, you can introduce yourself, uh, tell a bit about you, and then I'll, I'll follow up and do the same, and then we can just jump into it. All right, man. Well, my name is Mark Winkler, and uh, first and foremost, I'm a father uh -huh. and uh, of three girls. I have a daughter who is um, just turned 12, man. We, we'll talk about that a little bit more. Yeah. And I have two stepdaughters. One uh -huh. is 16, and one is 14, almost 15. Okay. So I have a lot of a lot of feminine energy sort of circling See. around me, man. But it's okay though, right? Because I I learn uh, from that energy. It helps me to grow as a man, right? Uh, and so uh, I'm also the author of a book uh, called My Daughter's Keeper, mm -hmm. which uh, we're going to be talking about today with with your book, brother. And yep. and so uh, I'm excited. You know, when we first start communicating about this, man, it was exciting uh -huh. to me because. As you put together that flyer, you aptly put it, men don't really communicate on this level that often, right? right. And for us to be able to, it's a, it's a growing movement, but it, it's, it still doesn't happen as much as it should happen and as much as it will happen in the future right. if the trend continues. So I was excited, man. I was excited because um, I think we both wrote uh, really insightful books, really um, honest books. Yep. And to have an open and honest dialogue about that and some of the things that some of the reasons why we put certain things in was yep. exciting to me, man. So I'm excited to be able to share this platform with you today. So what about you, brother? Well, <laughs> uh, I'm Floyd Rounds Jr. I reside in Atlanta, uh, as we spoke about earlier. Um, I actually have a child that I raised um, for the first eight years of her life, and I'm going to talk about that as we get into it. So. I do know about the feminine energy, you know, uh, <laughs> and the female. <laughs> and um, also, I am married. Been married for six years to my my wife. Um, mm -hmm. But we don't have any children together, so that's another element that the book talks about. You know, co-parenting with mm -hmm. uh, someone outside of the marriage. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's what I talk about in the book. But we're happily married six years, and um, everything's good, man. And of course, I've written a book, Floyd's ah, story. There it is. <laughs> Lila. So in the book, you know, I talk about uh, I talk about different topics. I talk about grief. Uh, there's a chapter on, on losing my brother when he was 20 years old. So I talk about approaching the grief process and how my family did that. I talk about relationships and, you know, the process of meeting and marrying my wife and things I've learned from marriage uh, as far as dealing with families, dealing with money. 
Um, but the big chapter, which is about half of the book, is a chapter on co-parenting where I talk about uh, my story, and we'll get into that as we go, uh, my co-parenting story. Uh, what I learned from that, and uh, paternity is part of the title, so we'll get into that too. It's, it's a lot in that chapter, man. I touch on a lot. Of you, you put a lot in that, a lot, a lot in that gumbo soup chapter, huh, brother? <laughs> gumbo soup, and we we gonna get into it. So y'all will be full when we uh finish with this. So all right, all yeah. right, there I'm you go. And I'm ready to hear about about your story too, man. So I'm all right, let's jump it. into it, brother. Okay, so I'll start with you. I got some questions I want to, you know, okay. get into the book. Um, that I have right here, just to make sure I remember um, everything mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you. Okay. Uh, so I know your book discusses uh, the accountability of past behavior. And first, actually, before we get into that, uh, mm -hmm. you want to just, uh, just I guess, give a maybe 30, 30 seconds to a minute, I guess, mm -hmm. your book, and then we'll dive into those questions just to introduce people to it. Absolutely. So the book is called My Daughter's Keeper. It's about my journey. Uh -huh. to get my daughter back in my life once uh -huh. uh, I was separated from her uh, -huh. uh because uh, I was separated from her and I had to go through a court a long really a long but I found out as I got into some fatherhood groups man uh -huh. not as long as some other fathers but I for me relatively speaking it was it was a long process for me to get my daughter back into my life so I learned a lot about myself I learned a lot about the court system and you know, so I wanted to capture what I learned, and mm -hmm. and 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 put it in a book as a as I often say as a source of understanding for men, mm -hmm. and a hope for men going through this process, and understanding for women. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, when I say that last part, I mean women who go through this process, whether they adopt a man who is going through this process, right. adopt a man in their life, or if the woman is on the other side of the court aisle. Uh, yeah. going through this process. I want them to understand that there's a lot that the father's going through, uh -huh. especially if there's a good father in front of them, right? a father who was was diligent while they were together uh -huh. and who wants to be diligent now, what that father may be experiencing and what that father may not be saying. So I put those things in the book. So there you go. That's good. That's good. <laughs> and, and, you know, a lot of those things you don't really, you're, you're not aware of them until you're in the situation. You know, right. I learned you're not aware of these things and they've been happening for years. But once you're right, in, that's where, you know, you kind of see how, how it is. It's difficult. Look, look, they can tell me about the cold on the East Coast. Right. They can talk about how cold it is. But I won't know that until yep. I go back. I was grew up on the East Coast and I forgot that when I went back there a couple of years ago. Uh -huh. I said, oh, that's what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I realized what it was like. So absolutely, brother. Absolutely. Yep. So that's good. You know, I, I I was born in St. Louis, so you know I forget how cold it gets there sometimes until I go back. So you were born in St. Louis. I was born in St. Louis. Yep, yep, born in St. Louis. <laughs> the co-parenting collection asks, "What was your ex's reason for keeping uh, your child from you?" Well, we're going to talk about that a little bit, but just real briefly, it was you know as I as I write in the book, uh, she okay. decided at a certain point that it was. Uh, I guess it, it was it was a, a a tool or a strategy to get me to respond to her in the way that I guess would have been favorable to her, uh -huh. and a lot of fathers they go through that so they they understand what that when I say a certain strategy it was unfortunate I don't think that was her character but I do think that at the moment at the time she felt that that was a viable strategy. But before you jump into the questions for me, I just want to say I don't know if you know but I was born in St. Louis as well. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Yes, so so this is actually this is actually this is actually more ordained than what I thought, brother. Okay, okay. yeah, my parents. Um, I don't know my dad. My mom was born in Louisiana, but she moved okay. to when she was younger. My dad was born in St. Louis, so they they grew up in North on the North Side, North St. Louis, and, and we're going to have to talk more when we get off, brother. Because yeah, we probably right. have some connections we don't even know. Yeah, yeah, we'll talk about that. Absolutely. And just to mention to anybody that's watching, um, we're we're going to take. We want to talk about the books a little bit and some of the topics, and then at the end, we want to take more questions. So mm -hmm. tune in. You can go grab somebody, have them join the live, and uh, mm -hmm. just go from there. So, all right, so let's get some of the questions that I have. Mm -hmm. In your book, you talk about the accountability of past behavior and how mm -hmm. it impacts the co-parenting relationship, which, which I can understand that. So can you speak on why that's important? I, I talk a lot about accountability, in the book, right? And the reason I do is because 
there's always two sides to every story, right? There's always, it's, it, when you have two people and a, something happens, there's, there's things on both sides that created that dynamic, right? right? So if I would have been on my side saying everything was on the other side and I had nothing to do with it, I was just a, uh, a, a victim, just mm -hmm. all of this debris hitting me, right. that would have been a disservice to myself. It would have been unfair to the child's mother Uh -huh. The accountability part for me was necessary because I had to look at my faults. I had to look at the things that I did mm -hmm. that contributed to the situation that we were both in. Right. That was necessary. So because in order for me now to then once now that we're out of that court situation, in order for me to have a, a any semblance of a, of a good co-parenting or even a parallel parenting yep. dynamic, I have to be able to not be just solely upset with her, right? I have to say, this is what I did. This is what I contributed. So now I'm going to change these behaviors so I can have a fruitful, hopefully a fruitful co-parenting situation or parallel yeah. parenting situation. But even more importantly than that, or equally important for it, is that I can have a flourishing parenting situation now with my wife. Right. Right, because if I never looked at what I did wrong, I would have brought all of those same dynamics to the table here, yeah. and I just would have been recreating yeah. the scenarios that I went through there. Uh -huh. And then we'd be talking about the next book I wrote, how that marriage fell. <laughs> <laughs> so I just wanted to write one book like this and then move on yeah. to something and new. And, and I, I like what you said because in a lot of those relationships, like as the man, you're doing it. Uh, even on, on the women's side, sometimes they may or may not do, but you're holding yourself accountable. By right. Saying, like, well, what, what did I do wrong? Because a lot of times exactly. I don't see that. And, and as I talk about my story, uh, that kind of still hasn't happened on both sides. So mm -hmm. it, it's, that's good that you're taking accountability for what you could have done better. And that's right. That's and, and, and that's, see, that's all you can really do. Right. Right. And hopefully by you doing that, the other person will respond in kind. But if not, you have a clean conscience and you have a clean slate and you become an example for your child on how to handle situations, even if the situation is still bumpy. So there you go. Right. Oh, <laughs> so I would say, I say, all right, so what are the pros and cons of starting a new relationship while you're going through a custody dispute? As you said uh -huh. uh, earlier, someone may inherit that. Your wife may have inherited your situation. Right. So what are the pros and cons of that? Someone once said to me, maybe I think someone from St. Louis said, <laughs> you don't open one door, and then the other door is closed, right? Because right. that wind may come in. And I think that, you know, in hindsight, you know, I, I and, and I write in the book that, and that's part of my accountability, right? I was, you know, I was, I was in a hurt place, and I wanted to heal, right? And my healing, I didn't realize, started with me. I didn't fully comprehend how that, self-healing would then lead to a better co-healing once right. you're in that dynamic with someone who is actually compatible with you, right? right? I didn't realize that that compatibility would be made stronger if you looked at your own dynamics first. Right. So I, I, I say that it's important. The pros are it helps you to be able to not bring that baggage into the relationship, right? right. It helps you to be able to be more clear-minded It helps you to be able to look at the other person with a clean slate, and then you guys are dealing with your own, your own personal dynamics, one to the other, as opposed to a triangular situation, because right. you still have that other dynamics that you're trying to manage. It may never go away, right? But mm -hmm. if you're in the midst of it, you're actually dealing with it more. I think that, so. So that's the pros. The cons are you may you may end up being lonely, man, and that's and that for a lot of people that's hard to deal with. Right. So I think I think that loneliness you have to find a way to manage and to deal with that won't you won't bring that to someone else. Right. So I think for me now I learned that there's actually more pros to closing one door firmly, right? right, and then opening up the other door fresh with a fresh perspective. And that's good. And two things that mm -hmm. from that was that number one, you talked about healing and it's it's good. Uh -huh. My book was sparked by me trying to heal myself. And I'll talk about mm. that when we get to that. Okay. Day. Healing is a good thing. And also the fact that, you know, when you're in a relationship or someone's kind of inheriting what you have, when you get to mm -hmm. the tough spots, 
you know, or when things are, are in a better spot, you can look back and see what your wife or what that person, what they're actually kind of going through because you're in a position where you can listen to them more and kind of hear how they felt, you know, just being right. you know, supporting you because they're around this child as well, you know, when you have Absolutely, to absolutely. So, so that, that, that's good. That's good. <laughs> All right. I learned a lot, brother. <laughs> yeah. <I know. laughs> that's good. That's good, man. It, 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 it turned out, you know, it came together in an amazing book. So that's Absolutely. Thank that's you, man. Happy. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. All right, so uh, one question I have is, talk about, uh -huh. I guess, the moment with Keisha uh -huh. and, and how that impacted your understanding of motherhood. Well, for me, I think that was one of the most impactful moments in my life, but also for me when I was writing the book and, re and rethinking that. Uh -huh. I was, you know, I was going through this tremendous court situation, uh, Child Protective Services, and it was exhausting, right? And I, I was feeling the weight of all of the, all of the dynamics of those two things. Mm -hmm. And, but I still had to maintain um, a, 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 the semblance of happiness around my daughter. I couldn't let her be sucked into this vortex of fatigue, worry, and upset, right? I still had to somehow find a way to protect her, right, from that. So I tried to, you know, continue routine things. Right. And one of the things that we had gotten used to was going to the park, right? So I took my daughter to the park, and I was just so tired, man. But I wasn't tired enough where I still wasn't alert to what I was doing, right? I was looking around the park, and I was noticing that there were so many women in the park, right? And, yeah. and then I looked even deeper, and I noticed the fatigue on their faces, and I started to look at my face and then look at their face. And I realized I just wasn't experiencing fatigue from this, from the court and child protective services. Because by that time, Floyd, I had my daughter and I was dealing with her as a single father. Right. Right. So I was getting her up. I was getting her ready for school. I was cooking dinner. I was preparing lunches, breakfast. I was doing all those things that before I didn't do. Right. Right before I would, you know, get her up, tell her some jokes, give her a kiss, and yeah. I'll go to work. Yeah, come home, expecting to see her, give her a kiss, but also expecting to eat. Right. Yeah. So, so all of these other things that go on in a person and in, in a family dynamic, uh -huh. I was only attuned to a few parts of it. But right. now, like most women who are single mothers, but also in committed relationships. They still carry a lot of the, the weight of the of the family dynamics. Right. They have to worry about you know budgeting. They have to worry about you know the preparation of meals, and right. that takes a lot out of you, especially when you're a mother that works full time. But if you're a single mother without the support, that's even that's even more that that that, that weight is even more compounded. Yeah. So I realized at that moment, man, I went out the fatigue I was experiencing uh -huh. was the fatigue of motherhood. Oh, wow. and um, that was a, that was a, that was a, a, a revelation. Yeah. And so I called my mother, and I just, and as I say in the book, my daughter's keeper. I called my mother and I thanked her, you know, for oh, being the woman that she is and she was to me and my brothers. Right. She didn't know why, but yeah. you know, I just, I at that moment, I felt I had to do that, man. So anyway, so that's what that was about. That's powerful. Man. <laughs> that's very powerful. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, like I said, I learned a lot. <laughs> yeah, I see. <laughs> I hope everybody else can learn a lot too, man. They need to go get you. They really do. They absolutely, do. absolutely, man. So, all right, talking about the courts and the court process. What uh -huh. role did your spiritual life play in that court process? Well, who's ever? If you've ever gone to court, right? You've ever gone to court. If you've ever experienced child and protective services. That is a debilitating process. At times, it is a shameful process. At times, it is just an outright a process that will bring a certain degree of hopelessness to you, right? And I began to experience those dynamics, and then in experiencing those things, Floyd, I had to, I had to, I had to realize, I had to say to myself, "Where is your, where, where is your source of strength?" Uh -huh. What have you leaned on before that's gotten you through these type of moments? Right. Right. Because it's easy to forget that, right? 
And so I had to turn into myself first to remember, and then I had to turn out of myself and then reconnect with the energy that I call my higher power. Right. And to rely on that and those things that I could not see. I couldn't see the pathway forward. Mm -hmm. I couldn't see if I was going to get my daughter, keep my daughter in my life because I'd already got her back, right, at a certain yep. point. Uh -huh. um, but even before that, I, I didn't know if I was going to get her back. I didn't know if I was going to keep her. Right. I didn't know if the court was going to be biased against me because I was a black man because historically those things happen, right? Yeah. I, I had so many unknowns that I had to stop incorporating those things into my real estate. Uh -huh. mental real estate and say, I need refuge. Right. So I fell upon my spiritual beliefs. Right? I fell upon my belief that, that I was not put on this earth as a father, not to be a father. Right. Right? Yeah. I said, I was meant to be a father, but not just be a father, to be a good father. And so I said that that is what I'm going to, that is what I'm going to lead with. And that brought me to what I say in the book that, what I started to lead with was not fear, not doubt, not uh, shame, love. Because to me, my higher power is love, right? right? So I said that I am going to lead with love. And I did that, man. And doing that, I began to take different directions. I, become, I began to get out of my shell. I joined a couple of men's groups uh, right. where I, that I went to, and it really helped me to be able to we, to connect with gentlemen like yourself going through this dynamic. Yep. And so my spiritual beliefs, brother, really buoyed me. It kept me up. And one more, you know what? It more than kept me up, man. It kept me hopeful. Right. And I think a lot of men lose hope in this situation. Yeah, yeah. So it kept me kept me hopeful, brother. And I can understand that. I can understand that. Uh -huh. Because, you know, when I got to a climax that I'll talk about in a little bit in my uh -huh. story, you know, you kind of, you lose hope, but if you have support, mm -hmm. it'll keep you up, and that's something I'm sure you know about as well. So absolutely, man. Yeah. absolutely. And part of the reason we've written these books is because we know that a lot, some men out there don't have that kind of support. You know, right, tough to hear that you're not alone in these things, and that's kind of what you, you know, your story is an example of that. That you know, you, you went through these situations in the courts and with defects and all of that. So uh -huh. someone that's reading the book or is watching this video can say. Hey, he's going through it too. So. Well, that, that goes back to my point why I wrote the book for men, a source of hope. Mm -hmm. Because in that, in that darkness of aloneness, man, and a lot of men isolate and they don't really talk about their feelings and what they're going through. They don't, they, we're, we're, the, we're the people who don't ask for directions, right? So, yeah. Yeah. so you know, it's really hard for us to ask for uh, support about something so personal. Yeah. But when I was in those rooms, man, with other fathers, specifically an organization out here called Project Fatherhood, when I was in those rooms and I saw a gentleman like you smiling, even though some guys hadn't seen their child in three or four years, yeah. I knew the pain was still there, but they had hope. Man, I said, I, I, I got to rely on my spiritual self in order to get me through this, man. So that's what I did, brother. That's actually something that... that you just kind of put me on because mm -hmm. since I've seen my child, I'm going to talk about that. But uh -huh. actually going to one of those one of those groups, they uh -huh. think to help me with my situation. So that's something Absolutely, I just brother. got with you that, you know, after this. See, this is not, brother, this is how it is, brother. One, <laughs> yeah. one, one, yeah. one to the other, man. <laughs> yeah. I have support and, and family I could talk to, and a wife I could talk to, but uh -huh. you know, just being around other people. And I experienced that in the chapter where I talk about losing my brother, just going to uh -huh. support groups where people lost other siblings. Help right, me because I knew that they knew what I was feeling. Absolutely, so, so those groups are important. I guess that's one important thing that hopefully people get out of this is that you know groups like that are are, are important. You can't isolate, man, because when you isolate, what happens is you begin to those thoughts, those negative thoughts, they begin to reverberate around your thoughts, around your head and your mind, and yeah. you get stuck. You no longer open. I was just talking to my daughter about this a moment ago. The moment you close up, and most men close up in this situation, we close around our fear, we close around our doubt, our shame, we close up. And so we close all of that dynamics into our system. And then we, what we have to do in order to feel good about that closing, we have to construct the world around there so we can feel safe so nothing else could come in. But when yeah. you go to those groups, man, you're forced to come out of there and listen to gentlemen like yourself who's mm -hmm. gone through a situation. Yeah. And who still finds opportunity to be to find joy and to find hope. Right. Right. Yes, sir. 
And I noticed the uh, co-parents collective said that, the, but you have to have the right support system. So no, that's the thing. You you do, and and and, and that's that's another thing I talked about. Right. And, and when I when I said I'm adopting love, I couldn't do that with negativity around me. So I even had to stop having conversations with some of my friends and family. I loved them. I knew they loved me, mm -hmm. but they were negative, man. So I couldn't have that negative energy in my mind because, like I said, the real estate is only, you only got so much room for that. Right. So I had to find, collective, you're right, I had to find the right space to go where the gentlemen were hopeful and there wasn't bitterness in the room. Right. Yes, sir. Good, good, cool. <laughs> So, you know, talking about the courts, uh, uh -huh. you may have touched on it a little bit, but how did you navigate, uh, I guess, de defects in the courts as a black man? Well, just real briefly, man, because I definitely want to hear, you know, about about your book, man. But mm -hmm. so I, I knew that 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 dynamic existed. I knew that historically black men and black women, sometimes when they're going to court, they're seen as different than some of their other racial counterparts. That, that's a fact, right? There's, there's no, someone, people can argue that, but historically that's been documented. So I knew that I had to go into court with a certain presentation. Right. I knew I had to, and that presentation was, I had to dress a certain way. I had to, in my talk, I had to use certain tonality. I could not do projections of anger against the mother. Uh, I couldn't project my anger at, at times that I was feeling uh, to the judge and, and what I was saying, because I knew that if I did that, uh, brother, that the narrative against me was going to be deemed as true. Right. And all the hopes I had to have my daughter back and all the right that I had to have my daughter back in my life, I would have slowed that process down considerably if I would have then given credence to what was written, the, the, the false things that were written against me. Right. So I said to myself, I have to approach this in a way that they see a father who loves his daughter right. and not maybe some of the historically negative images that they've gotten from the media about who they think I am. Right. All right. <laughs> and All right, brother. All right. So let's, 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 let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, Floyd's story. Yeah, let's get into it, man. Let's get into it, man. It. I want to know. There it is. There it is. <laughs> a letter to Dahlia. What was yeah. the inspiration for this book, man? Tell us, you know, bring us into the thinking and of your inspiration when you decided that I want to write this book. Right. Well, you know, my background is actually, you know, in corporate real estate. So mm -hmm. that's what I do. So, but I've always been a writer. Mm -hmm. on, uh, you know, I've always written resumes and. Mm -hmm. uh, content for people. So writing is something I've always done. And people are mm -hmm. always I gonna, ever going to write a book. And I'm saying, I, I doubt it. Mm -hmm. And I lost my little brother back in 2008. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people were asking me, you need to write a book about it. I said, well, no, nah, I'm not really at that point. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the child that I raised, you know, I called Delilah in the book. She was born. Mm -hmm. uh, that situation happened over a number of eight and nine years. And then it mm -hmm. came to the climax. And then at that point, it was something that, that kind of hurt me and my family, what happened. Mm -hmm talk about that okay. so at that point you know i was just sitting there and i you know it just kind of hit me you know you know god i believe in god and god said hey man you just came around it's time to write a book <laughs> you know and i'm I, I trying to figure out okay why is now the time and i i realized that it was to help me kind of heal it was like uh -huh. therapy writing because i've always kind of written i used to write poetry when i was younger okay but therapy of that you know made me decide to start talking about my life talking about my brother, talking about my, my marriage, and then talking about uh, my child. And that, that's okay. what inspired the book. You know, yeah. the, uh, the, the therapeutic yeah. aspect of that, you know, I think is so important. I, for me, you know, when I hear you say that, it, it makes me understand that once you start to get it out, yep. right, if you yeah. put it on paper, yeah. even if the intention is to not put it out, uh -huh. There's something on your unconscious that knows that it could go yeah. out. And so you start to release, man. And I think it's the holding on yeah. to that, that, as I said before, that keeps us in a certain prison. Yeah. You, you, The book is, is you write about a lot of subjects in the book, Floyd, but right. the right. chapter about Delilah, am I saying that right? Yeah, Delilah. Yeah. Delilah yeah. Um, is the longest one. Yeah. Right. Talk about that. Talk about why yeah. so much 
energy, thought energy went into that chapter. Right, right. Now, and I'll talk about that. Uh -huh. uh, touch on the healing part of it. The other mm -hmm. part of healing for me was also the fact that in the book, I, I released a lot of things that a lot of people didn't know about mm. the situation. Uh, uh -huh. You can imagine what that is from the title. Uh, okay. Attorney, but so part of that was just releasing all this that I've been holding in for years. You know, my uh -huh. family knew, but even family outside of that didn't really know things I talk about. So just releasing that was also an element of healing. And, and talk a little bit about that and the, and the releasing. What did that do for you, Floyd, and the it, releasing of that? It, you know, it, it was it was just like releasing tension. You know, like I'm uh -huh. a weighted vest. You know, just uh -huh. kind of put it out there, you know, so people can understand you know what was going on because i didn't think what i didn't know what people would think when i released uh -huh. know, when i released and just the fact of getting it off you know it was just a weight off and then people really mm -hmm. and they appreciate the transparency were you worried about what people would think about you is that why you were carrying it so close to the chest yeah i was worried about well particularly family that uh -huh. time around the child worried about mm -hmm. about me keeping something from them about uh -huh. that was kind of what, what worried me but of course, they it didn't take it like that. People people loved me for what I did. You know, they loved me for the father uh, that I was and that I am. So right, you know, it turned out great. You know, it turned out great. Everybody, so the ones that loved you before loved right. you after. Love me more after. Love you more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I, I I'll talk about the book and the way I, I talk. Uh -huh. I kind of tell the story that I tell in the book. So I'm gonna tell mm -hmm. you now. And while I'm doing that, I'll touch on some of those important things okay. that I talk about in the book. So. Mm -hmm. Chapter Delilah kind of starts off with me meeting um, the child's mother, who in the book I call uh -huh. Emily Thompson. Okay. Uh, similar to her real name, but I'm not going to say her real name. Right. Um, and I met her at a party back in 2009. You know, I was mm -hmm. a single man partying, you know, and then, <laughs> yeah. As young yeah. single men do. Young single <laughs> man in Atlanta. You know, at the party and, you know, so I, after that, about a month after, within the next month, you know, we got together a couple of times and mm -hmm. I won't get into the details of that, but we got together. Mm -hmm. And I received um, a text saying to call me, low, you know, a little bit, maybe about a month mm -hmm. down the road. And, you know, she told me she was pregnant, you mm -hmm. know. So, and that's all. And, and, and you know, men can, can relate to this, you know. So I asked, you know, is it my child? You mm -hmm. know, said, yes, I don't really know, you know, many people here, you know. And mm -hmm. I said, is there anybody else? She said, no, you know. And then my parents, who I'm, I'm pretty close to, Mm -hmm. uh, they also met her, and, and she told them the same thing. So at this time, I accepted it because I was, as a man, you know, and for men that, that might find themselves in this situation, you mm -hmm. know, a man, no matter what, you know, I'm going to treat her with respect. So I supported her throughout the pregnancy, mm -hmm. you know, financially, you know, for the most part, you know, all throughout the pregnancy. And, of course, the child was born in 2010. Mm -hmm. And within that first year, I probably had the child with me a majority of the time, you know. So I talk about mm -hmm. the element of, you know, a mother that hadn't really had a bond. You know, mo most women, when their child is born, they can't really be away from them for more than a day, really. That's uh, true. Probably one particularly like, you know, she's a right. big person. So, with the first year, I probably had the child with me maybe three to four to five days out of the week. You know, so wow. I talked about that as a man and, and how that mm -hmm. role, you know, and, and the, the bond I developed with her. So, mm -hmm. about, when the child was about a year old, um, you know, the mother, came to me and I was already pretty much helping her pay her rent. Uh, mm -hmm. My family, I'd helped her get a, a couple cars. So uh -huh. I was pretty much supporting her and she came to me one day and said, I need I need a stipend from you. And I'm, mm -hmm. you know, I'm like, have you bumped your head? <laughs> <laughs> I said, really? I mean, I got a child with me as much as you do and I'm helping you out. And then she, right. she put me on child support. Uh -huh. And things kind of went left. So I, at that time, you know, I felt like I was stable. And I talk about all this mm -hmm. support because some men go through this. Where mm -hmm. I talk about child support. And what I did was I was stable. I felt I was more stable at this time. So mm -hmm. uh, in the book, I talk about it's important to get a lawyer. So mm -hmm. what I point was I got Absolutely. Lawyer, you know, I, I got all, I saved all my documentation, all the, all the babysitter receipts, everything. Mm -hmm. uh, even the, the, the money I was giving her for rent, all that I had, it all mm -hmm. So that's important. And that's one Keeping thing records, that's so important. Absolutely. Right. So people that are watching, that's the one thing I talk about in the book is as men or women. I mean, women can go through, maybe go through this too, but I know it's true. Sure. Men, save your records, save everything, mm -hmm. document everything. So I Absolutely. talk about it. And um, as we got closer to go to court, you know, my lawyer asked me how I had a DNA test. And I said, I said, no, when the child was born, she looked a lot like my mom, you know. And then she said, mm -hmm. you know what they say in the, in the country, 
if you feed somebody long enough and they're around you long enough, they start to look like you. So, <laughs> so we talked, you know, that, I said, yeah, you're right. So, and throughout the process, I had a DNA, te DNA test and I found out that Delilah wasn't my biological child. Okay, hold on a second. Right. Hold on. right. That's a big moment. Right. right. So I definitely want you to jump into that. But I, I want to just backtrack for a second, right? Because I, I want to hear a little bit about yeah. when you first heard the news, you know, you asked, was the child yours, right? Right. Flash forward, you are basically taking care of the child on a, on a, on a, almost singly. Right. 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 How, what happened that you made that transition? Did you have family support? in your own self, did you have to do certain things in, in your own life for yourself to make that transition to that point? Uh, I mean, as far as having a child, like raising a child, like singing. raising a child, accepting that you were a father first, right? And then stepping up to the plate where you're not just a father coming over and visiting, right. but you are actually at the role of primary caregiver. Yeah, it, I kind of mentally transitioned myself. Uh huh. While she was pregnant. To mm -hmm. say, okay, things are going to change when this child gets here. So when the child uh -huh. and just kind of bonding with this child, it really changed me. And you and you'll know as a father when you had your first mm -hmm. child, it changes the way you look at the world. You know, it's right. about me. So I kind right. of you know, and biological or not, you still have that bond, and, and that's something that I, I try to get people to understand. You still bond with that child. So that sure. right home helped me get into the mode of taking care of this child. And then I have family support. I have my parents, and then uh -huh. my wife when my child was about 10 months old. Mm -hmm. So she, she came on and, and she jumped in and, and she was all there for me. And that was that was important. You know, we talk about them in uh -huh. situation. That was important to have her saying, hey, you know, I, I, I'm here for you. You know, whatever you decide to do, I have that support. So all of that helped with the, you know, transition of into fatherhood. So you were married during the time? Explain no, the part of I wasn't married at that time. The, uh -huh. that was, it was around 2000. Well, I met my wife. Uh, early in 2011, the child was born. Okay, and I got married in 2013, but she was with me. Okay, so she was with you. So she, so she then came aboard, and she had started to give you the support as well. Yes, she did. Okay, she did. did you have examples in your life, man? Did you have like uncles, fathers, where you could see, or were you kind of just like going at it as, or, or as just not without any instructions? <laughs> oh no, I, no, I got, uh, I got good examples. My parents have been married. Uh, it's thir made 39 years this year. Okay, wow. So, so that, Congratulations that was, to them. That's beautiful. Yeah, and, and most of my good friends, um, childhood friends, their parents are still together, too. So I, I've always seen good family. Okay. That's what, that was the decision as we get into, you know, me deciding to stay in this child's life. That was part of what made me decide to stay in that child's life. Okay, let's let, let's talk about that now. Yeah, so, you know, I found... You have this big moment happen. Yeah, big moment happen. And uh -huh. I break that down because... You know, and you see on Maury and all of this when, you know, these paternity tests, you know, guys find out they're not the father. They start breakdancing and all this stuff. But, right, right, right. You know, but you have guys on there that, that you know, and some of that stays a lot. But people don't yeah. realize what happens when you're not on TV. You sure. got to move forward with your life. So I had to decide what I was going to do. And I talk about this in the book because there's men out there that go through this. They, uh -huh. they out, you know, they might find out down the road that two or three or four of their kids aren't theirs. Sure. So, you have to figure out how to move forward, you know. And at this stage, I could have walked away. I talked about how. That. How old was she? Uh, she was at that about time? one years old. About one year. One, okay, go ahead. Yeah, so I could have walked away at that moment, or I could have. Mm -hmm. At that time, I felt like I could give her a great life, and I felt like if I stepped out of her life, things might not have gone as good for her. So all that was, mm -hmm. like, you know what? I have, I have a bond with this child. I'm going to raise this child, and so mm -hmm. I talked about it. About that, I told her, I said, hey, I'm, I'm going to stay in this child's life. And in the book, mm -hmm. I talk about how I made that decision. Mm -hmm. and how come in and they be questioning if a child is theirs now. You right. Know, do you, are you going to step out of that child's life if that child isn't yours? Do you mm -hmm. even want to know? So I talk about all of these things in the book when it comes to paternity because a mm -hmm. lot of people are going through this, but they don't really realize this aspect of it. You know? Absolutely. So, and as a man, I never thought this would happen to me. I used to grow up watching uh, Jerry Springer and Maury. Yeah, and, right, know, right. That life. That was somebody else's life. Right, right. Never right. yours. I get it. Yeah. And it happened to me. So Right. So I talk about that whole dynamic and, and so that that's that's in the paternity part, I talk about how I approached it, how uh -huh. I made it, how men that are going through that, what they can look at or not, you know, 
deciding on because if a child is young, you know, we find out a child is yours when the child's in his first month or two. Right. If some men may decide it's better to walk away, you know, because they, they the child they don't have a bond with the child, you know, the mother has lied to them, so that relationship right there is already damaged. They right. may decide to walk away, you know, and some men may say, you know, I don't even want to know. Them some men may not even get a test and that, and I applaud them. You sure. Know, to raise a child, that that's great. You know, so I just talk about the different dynamics of that. Now there must have been some back and forth in your mind. It was. Right. Oh, oh, I mean, so talk just a little bit about that, man, because some of that back and forth must have been fueled by people. Cause I don't know if you had told people at that point. So can you talk about some of the back and forth and how you then move past that? So, so you've already talked about it a little right. bit, but talk yeah. a little bit about the back and forth, because I'm interested in, in hearing yeah. about that dynamic. Yeah. yeah. And actually in the book, I, I, I dive into that back and forth. Uh -huh. But I, and I'll talk about it now, but in the book, mm -hmm. I have to that, but... You know, at that point, it wasn't back and forth because the child's mother was really like a stranger to me. Like, I really didn't mm -hmm. know her. And I talked right. about going through that pregnancy with a person that I really didn't even like. You know, this mm -hmm. was something that just kind of happened, on, you know, a fling or whatever. Right. And so, and I talked about how weird it was, and she was still a stranger to me. So that part of it made me kind of want to walk away. But at the same time, I had a bond with this child. This child knew me and would always mm -hmm. be as dad. So right. I about that that was the back and forth but you know my my well she's my wife now but at that point my she's my girlfriend she said hey well you know i'm here if that's what you want to do I'll, I'll support you my parents you know they they love the child as well they had a bond with the child too so they would say hey you know you this you know we, we're here you know uh -huh. and that was what part of the catalyst to say okay well you know what if i step away this child can end up in foster care because and i'm not going to bash the mother but sure. this, at that time uh, her skills were, were not great. Well, not good. Uh -huh. Really, to be frank about it, it was terrible. So right. I said, I could walk away. This child end up somewhere. And if something was to happen to this child, I don't know if I could take it if I had the power to change it. Uh -huh. So in my mind, I said, okay, you know what? I, I can get this child a good life. I got plenty of support. Right. Plenty, plenty of family support. I got cousins in the area. You know, sure. and all, so I decided to stay in the child's life. And that's how I made my decision. So I talk about in the book how men can look at different ways to make that decision. Yeah, and, and and you're right. I think there's a lot of different approaches to, you know, looking at, you know, the benefits to the child, how she's going to be raised, uh -huh. um, and and the type of environment, family environment, home environment. But I, I just really want to know specifically for you, yeah. right? Yeah. Was there a moment that you said, or did you not say, or did you think about, like, emotionally, uh -huh. how this was going to affect me? if I made the decision one way or the other? Uh, well, I, I would, like I said, it was, um, I think it was probably a matter of days where uh -huh. I made the decision. So during those, those days, I did look at emotionally how, how it would affect me, how it wouldn't. But I mm -hmm. knew that, and most men that will find themselves in the situation will probably think like me, even though some won't. But they would mm -hmm. say, oh, you know what? This child is not my biological child, but this is still my child. You know, mm -hmm. people can't understand that if they haven't been in a situation, but that's how I feel. Mm -hmm. My child still knows me as dad. So mm -hmm. that's what prompted me to do that. But some men, you know, may raise a child for three or four years. Yeah. The child isn't theirs, and mentally they can't take it, and they'll walk away. And it's easier to walk away if, if the mother of the child is capable of taking care of the child. In my situation, I had a bond with the child, but the mother also, I felt, couldn't adequately take care of the child on her own. So mm -hmm. those all kind of factored into why I decided to do that, you know. Mm -hmm. At a certain point, though, you did have to walk away from the right. co-parenting dynamic, right? Right, right. What right. brought you to that decision? Yeah. And walk us through that a little bit, brother. T t tell us how that happened. Okay. All right. So uh -huh. but the, more, the rest of the chapter, I talk about the different aspects of the child growing up and different co-parenting things we face such as mm -hmm. child being in my house being at her house being in my parents house mm -hmm. uh, a different dynamic um uh, my wife having to deal with the situation as well uh not getting along with with the child's mother you know i talk about all the different dynamics and mm -hmm. later on down the line around 2014 the uh the child's mother um in the book i just call it emily thompson we'll call it emily mm -hmm. he ended up um um she, she's She's a talker. She's a talker. And mm -hmm. she ended up actually um, befriending a Georgia State representative. And when that person ran for another position, she mm -hmm. was elected to the Georgia State House of Representatives. So she is currently 
a uh -huh. Georgia State representative. Uh -huh. uh, you know, and I'm not, I won't, her name is similar to what I use in the book. I'm not going to say her name, but so that has a different dynamic to the book because this person is still in the public eye and people really don't mm -hmm. know about that. So I kind of touch on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. And to get on further down the line, this person, um, that they wanted to make it seem like they raised a child on their own, but actually re raised a child really probably more than this person did. So as we mm -hmm. got to today, current years, the person started to try, the child's mother started trying to keep her a little bit more. Mm -hmm. away. And that kind of started to put a strain because the child mm -hmm. saw this, but the child couldn't really say anything to this person. Mm -hmm. um, and as it got later on to early 2018, it got to a point where uh, the child's mother was telling me, we're not, we're not, am and not going to see the child. And that's mm -hmm. kind of started because she had a certain image she wanted to portray. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and in the book, the main, one of the main points that I say is that um, when you're dealing with co-parenting, parents need to keep in mind that, you know, if a mother has an issue with a father, if a father has an issue with a mother, keep in mind that what you, the child gets lost in the mist. Absolutely. In because in, in, this, in this situation, I thought about the child, but the child's mother was more about mm -hmm. the than the child. Mm -hmm. I eventually got to a point where she told me I wasn't going to see the child, mm -hmm. you know, and, and pretty much use the words, you know, it's not a ghost. But you tell me when I'm going to see this child. And I had to remind her of the situation. You mm -hmm. know, other men go through this too. So I, in the book, that's one thing I dive into is when mm -hmm. this stuff happens, understand that you got to have rights. And we can talk about that in a little bit. <laughs> About the rights, because there was something I did when I found out the child wasn't mine sure. that kind of bite me in, in the butt now, which is uh, about signing away rights. So, okay. and it got to a point where this person pretty much got so disrespectful and for, I forgot about everything that me and my family had done over eight or nine years. Uh -huh. Point where I had to step back because I could no longer. It was, this person was making it hard, so hard mentally mm -hmm. that I had to step back until I can deal with the child on her own and that's kind of where i'm at now because it's, it's it was a tough situation and i don't mm -hmm. have those rights to the child and we can touch on that in a little bit why I don't. Mm -hmm. it's something that's important that many you know it's, it's a couple of things man i think one you yeah. said a couple of moments ago about when there's two people two parents one side and on the other side and they're lobbing bombs at one another i talk about this in my book too mm -hmm. the lobbing bombs back and forth the child is in the center of that right and all of the debris that's falling from those bombs impacting, the mm -hmm. child is absorbing. Right. Parents aren't really looking at, when they're in that dynamic, how is this affecting the child? Because right. the child may not even may, may not be a point in their mind in a developmental state where they can articulate how yep. this is affecting them. And they don't, they don't find out until later until the child begins to exhibit what they may call errant behavior. Or, or or unsociable behavior. That's right. Well, how did this happen? And then yeah. they forget it was during those times that all of that rancor was going one to the other, yeah. that this child, as you said, was right in the middle, like a sponge absorbing the energy, right? And to yeah. her mind, not knowing how to process it, right? Yeah. So she, she may be processing or he may be processing it like, this is my problem. This uh -huh. is my issues. I'm the cause of this. Mommy don't lie. I, the, I'm, the, I'm the reason this is happening, right? Yeah. And yeah. so you got to a point that you had to step away, right? Right, right. Because you didn't want that to affect the child anymore. Talk about the emotionality, man, because that is like a death almost, yeah. right? You're so right. So talk You're about right. that, man. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah, more. yeah. And, this stuff, and before I do that, I just want to address another co-parents collective said that, you know, my family and I were meant to be a part of the lightless life. And we understand. And I appreciate you saying that because that was That's beautiful. Thank you for I, saying that. I had to absorb and accept that because when I first made the decision to back away, it hurt. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I won't lie. I mean, I, I, I cried a few nights because I knew that mm -hmm. I was out for a while, but mm -hmm. I had to do it. And in the book, I talk about to toxic. I can't even say it. To toxicity. Toxicity, it's, right. It, it's toxic to your life, your family. Mm -hmm. You have to make tough decisions. And sure. I had to, in this case, um, and she talked about why I didn't adopt her. I'm going to get to that, too. Uh -huh. But I had to. And I, mm -hmm. I was to get to that question. Um, once it started to happen, if we found, we rewind back to when I first found out uh, the child wasn't mine, I had my right. wife, you know, I told her, I said, well, you know what? I talked to my family. I decided I'm mm -hmm. going to stay in the child's life. But I wanted to be protected in case mm -hmm. the woman, because... It's not beyond her, and I, I, like I said, I don't want to bash the person, but it's not beyond us, mm -hmm. you know, when they're exhibiting that, I guess, narcissistic behavior. Mm -hmm. to 
the money, even though I'm already doing what I'm doing and raising a child that's not mine. So mm -hmm. she's in Georgia. Um, you know, and we, we could talk about legitima legitimation of a child, but she said, all right, if you want to protect yourself, I don't think a judge is going to put you on child support ever, but you can sign this form. It's called a court order rescinding paternity acknowledgement form. And what it did was it pretty much legally removed me from the Georgia Pew to Fathers list that they use to put children on child support. Mm -hmm. but by doing that, it gave Emily sole custody of the child. Because you also remove yourself as the father, the, the assumed father, legally. Right, 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 right. 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 Such on legitimation, every, every state is different. But in sure. Georgia, if a, if a couple is married and they have a child, the child is automatically legitimized, which means the father automatically has rights sure. to the child. And if something happens, he can petition for custody. Right. If the child is born out of wedlock in Georgia. Even if the father signs a birth certificate, that child is not officially legitimized until he signs a petition for a legitimation. Petition for, 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 it's the same right. in California. It's the same right in California. Right. So pretty I, much, I had to, I had to go yeah. through the same process. Yeah. So I, I legitimized. Mm -hmm. I was legitimized as a child, but eventually I signed that away. So now when mm -hmm. you fast forward to why I didn't adopt them, when this stuff started to happen recently, mm -hmm. I had rights. I didn't have those rights. But at the same time, and I write about it in the book, I should not have to fight with a person when I willingly raised a child they knew wasn't mm -hmm. mine. To fight with them about getting custody or adopting a child, it just mentally I couldn't bring myself to do it because I had done so much. My family had done so much that, that, right. that to me it's like I – I shouldn't have to do this. And of course, I love the child. Everybody knows that because right. anybody can tell you that they they've seen us raising the child. Sure. The child, so nobody questioned my love for the child, but it just got to a point where this person got so toxic and they knew that I didn't have these rights that I had to step back. And and by doing that, I knew that I would sacrifice time with my child. But I know my child understands the situation because uh -huh. I talked to her a little bit um, before I, I haven't seen her in a while. But she understands really. But at the same time, it's hard for a child because. Half of that life is being pulled away. And ever since 2018, sure. I had to fall in out with my child's mother. I have not heard one peep from her since early last year. She has not tried to put a child in touch with me or anything because the child doesn't fully know uh, about her not being a biological child. She kind of mentioned, and I talk about it in the book where my mother is pretty involved. My mother actually saw her, I guess, the day after the last day I saw her. Mm -hmm. and she said the child, um, well, Delilah pulled her aside, you know, at school that field day. And said that, you know, her mom told her she wasn't going to see us much anymore. And my mom said, you know, oh, really? And she said, yeah, my mom told me why. You know, and she said, because we're, we're not blood. So after eight <laughs> years, and I talked about that in the book, this woman didn't even give me the opportunity to sit down with a child and explain that she wasn't mm -hmm. my child. So this child yeah. is pretty much now, you know, having to wonder about that. You know, that's if she, and she might have blocked it out, you know, but mm -hmm. the time that this was the way I was treated. So in the book, I talk about even though I was treated a certain way, I still always took the high road. I still knew that I prayed for the child. And then the, at the end of the chapter, I write a message to Emily Thompson. And then I write a letter to Delilah where I talk mm -hmm. about, and I pour my heart out in that letter. You know, that's the part of the book that makes people cry because I talk mm -hmm. about everything that's happened. I talk about it's not your fault. I know you're going to have certain thoughts, but mm -hmm. you understand that, you know, you understand me, you know, my heart, you know, your mother. Mm -hmm. Um, and in due time, we'll be able to talk about it and, and get back together. So that that that's what makes the book so deep because yeah. I've been through all of this. And then I, at the end of the at the end of the chapter, I talk about that. And people that are reading this, and I hope that mothers and fathers that are dealing with similar situations yeah. understand that if the person you're hurting most is the child. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm a grown man, you know, and you know the mother is. You know, I'm 39. You know, the mother is probably about 32, 33. But mm -hmm. you know, in her mind, she's expecting her nine-year-old child to walk away from the situation like her 32-year-old mind can, and it doesn't work. Right. And, some and, mothers, and, I, yeah, and most mothers out there can't really watch them children suffer, but there are some, a few mothers that actually will think about themselves first because they don't want their kids mm -hmm. to do things, and, and they'll allow the kids to suffer without, instead of right. giving them what they need. Well, I think, and, and that's so, you know, that's such a critical point, man, and I, you know, that's why in my book, I, I write a lot about how I protected and shielded my daughter during this process, right? Even at a certain point, we had to do exchanges at the police station. And I talked about how I would create this real fantasy world about how the police station was a castle and the, 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 the police officer were, officers were guards because I wanted to keep her mind away from as much as I could shield it 
from right. what was happening, right? Because as right. we talked about, you know, briefly before, that when the parents are going back and forth, the child being in the middle, the yeah. child is not saying anything often, but the child is still incorporating all of this, yep. all of this craziness in their system. Yep. And it's going to come out. Now, how it comes out, it can come out with them sort of being overindulgent in their studies. Yep. It can come out with them looking for some sort of refuge in the arms of someone who's not good for them. It can come out with them trying to self-medicate. We don't know the effects, right? But what we do know is this. We have the opportunity to do what you said, to keep that away from the child. Right. Right. And, you know, it, it, it's difficult, man. I went through several months with not seeing my daughter. Yeah. Right. And this is me seeing her every day. Yeah. Um, I remember watching this television show with The Rock and, you know, he was with he had a daughter and I couldn't even get through the show. Because yeah. as I write in my book, by that time, and you, as you just spoke about, it mm -hmm. was the separation. That separation was like a death to me because I didn't know, you know, if I was ever going to see her again. It turns out that, you know, my journey took me back to her. Your journey where you are now, she's mm -hmm. not, right? Yeah. So talk a little bit about how you keep hope, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, do you... What 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 are your thoughts in future in terms of in the of, for the future about yeah. seeing her again? Right, and then uh, <clears throat> in the end of the chapter, where I write the letter to Delilah. Uh -huh. I talk about you know how it hurt me to have to do what I have to do. I know that it would also hurt her because she would have no support. You know, her mm -hmm. mother taught her to talk about this. Her mother is the kind of person that would make her just not. She has to hold all this in. So I, I right. Talk about that in the future, you know, when she's able to contact me on her own, um, that that we have to help each other because, mm -hmm. you know, I admit as a man, you know, it, it had hurt me, you know, right. and I'm better now, you know, because I have support. I've been able to write about the book, uh, talk to people, so I'm good now because I know that, you know, she's going to be her own teenager. She's going to be her own person at some point where I can talk to her, and she's going to have things that, that, you know, as a child, you take certain characteristics from your mother, um, or from your father. So I know there's some things about her that she's going to have, and she's going to have to deal with this one day. So I say we're going to help yeah. you because you got to help me deal with the things that I, I've been missing and not being able to support, That's beautiful. Be support you mentally. Right. And right. how you can help me deal with it. And sure. Help me feel good knowing that I know that you that you love me and that you knew that I never wanted to not be around you. So we're going to help each other do that. And also, we're going to answer the questions and now with ancestry dot com and all of that, we 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 don't even know who a real father is. The mother sure. never has a great answer on that. So, but see, to me, man, to to yeah. right? To so me, because you said you said something. You said it real quick. You said you know, and it's real. It's real tough if you're not the father going through this. But see, you are the father, right? I mean, biologically, right? But you are the father, right? Yeah. Mentally and right. spiritually, you right. are the father. So yep. she's going to come back around, man, because the biolog she may want to learn the biological. Right. But the first seven years of a child's life is the most formative years, yep. right? Yep. So you were in there, man. Your soul, your heart, right. you were in there. And 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 even the fears I had about losing my daughter when I was going through the process, I knew that I put enough of my love into her soul right. that she would find her way back to me. Yeah. And that was part of my spiritual yeah. journey, man. That was a peace yeah. that came over me. And I had the same experience. I had the same uh -huh. when I actually realized that she knows we're going to be here. She she knows me, you know, and and I remember her telling me, you know, as I was raising her, you know, that mm -hmm. you said, you know, if, if I lose you, it'll hurt my heart, you know, and things like that was kind of what hurt me when I had to step away. But mm -hmm. I also write about in the book that, you know, she she's going to, she, she knows that she'll be back. And it, it can be, you know, it may be right away, or she may not ever want to know until years later, even after you reconnect it, you know, right. if we can reconnect, you know, it could be sometime soon, it could be a year or two or three hours, I just don't know. But right. when she, it could be when she's a grown woman where she said, hey, you know what, I'm ready to find. She can know, come say, meet your grandchild, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it could be then, but she's like, I'm ready to find.
can let it go back. We got to finish it. Then we cut off. Yeah, I'm, I'm coming to cut it back on. Oh, okay. So I, thought you did, I thought you did. Yeah, that. it's a good finish. So you have to go back in again? Yeah, yeah, a lot back in. Yeah, the hour. Mm-hmm. The universe tried to stop us, brother. <laughs> this is too, this is, this stuff is too powerful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it has an hour limit, man. I think that's what it is. It has an hour so, brother, limit. do we have. Do we have an opportunity to grab some of the, some of the questions before? Do we still have some of those, or do we do we not get those? Um. Well, people actually, some of them are rejoining now. So if anybody has any questions, you know, they they can ask. I'm I'm, I'm here. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Well, brother, look, I um. Here's the last question I got, man. Do you plan on doing any more writing? In mm-hmm. terms of in terms of like activism around this, are you doing anything in that, in that area? Talk a little bit about you know how you get the message out about the book and about you know the things you went through. Sure. Well, I, I see mm-hmm. uh, somebody asked where can I get the book. Uh, you can actually order the book from my website, which is floydstory.com. dot com. That's mm-hmm. F L O Y D S S T O R Y dot com, and there's a link there to Amazon. To actually, grab the book. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm working on the. Uh, Audio book was a whole different story. <laughs> we got to talk about that. I got to get that too. My book, you can get going on Amazon, but okay. the link is on my page and take you straight to the order page. Right, right. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. But um, as far as I plan on doing, one thing I plan on doing um, as a result of the book is mm-hmm. work, put together programs, and, and eventually in the form of a nonprofit to provide financial and emotional resources for mm-hmm. men who are seeking to get more custody of their kids because. Mm-hmm. Um, here, I, like I played flag football, for example, in a pretty good, a pretty competitive league in Atlanta. I hadn't played okay. in a few, months, and I played softball. And as people found out about the book, a lot of those guys came to me and said, "Hey, man, I've been trying to, you know, get more custody of my kids. Man, I was trying to see this." So there are a lot of men out there that that may want to get more custody, but they don't know where to start because they think it takes sure. and lawyers. So I want to put together an organization to help men um, of all races, and, and you know, just to kind of get together. Uh, whether it's emotional support in the form of groups, like you said, or right. financial resources and legal resources, you know, maybe uh, people who can, um, you know, lawyers and things like that that are willing to help donate their their efforts, um, sure. or just raise money to help fund men who are trying to get custody of their kids and, and petition them for that. Um, yeah, that's one thing I want to do in the future around this particular area of the book, but just in general, I want also uh, when it comes to writing the book, and I don't. I want to show we didn't talk about how we published our books, but I sell mm-hmm. mine through okay. you know, direct publishing on Amazon. Uh huh. Um, so I, that whole process, you know, writing the book was was a process, but actually publishing the book to me was even harder because I had mm-hmm. to edit it and and get, design a cover, which I did all of that myself. You know, I mm-hmm. did it myself. So I want to also um, work on my consult business to help people self publish their books. That's beautiful, man. Mine, I, I was going to go the self-publishing route. I, I, I talked to a few different uh, self-publishing companies, but I ended up with a company that was making a sort of a transition from a self-publishing to a traditional publishing uh, right. called November Media. And okay. they, you know, I became like their first uh, self-published, not self-traditional published author, man, um, uh, on their, it's called Journey Press under November Media. But mm-hmm. similar to you, Matt, it still was a process, right? Because, you know, when you have something in you that you want to get out and you're not right. connected to an apparatus to do so, mm-hmm. you know, that, that's a journey, man. I think that's where a lot of people sort of sort of stop, right? They don't, right. They, don't they, they say, look, I got this thing, but how do I get it out, right? right? You went and you said, you know, I'm going to traverse and I'm going to go up the mountain. I'm going to do this. I did the same thing, man. I was blessed to get a comp- in communication uh-huh. with a uh, sister by the name of Taisha Beasley. And she, you know, under her company, again, November Media, she put the book out, man. And, and we worked sort of hand in hand on the design. I was blessed to have a, a, a gentleman by the name of uh, uh, Laurent, what is his name? Uh, Lorenzo Adams. Uh, yeah. Alonzo, uh, Alonzo Adams. He did the cover art, man. I saw his picture. I was like, I got to use it. One, because it looks so much like my daughter. And I don't think that's my daughter. And so it was a big process, man. So like you, there was a lot of, you know, sort of baking and cooking I had to do myself. Right. And that was difficult, man. And I think that's where a lot of people who have really, like you said, the guys in those softball teams and those other sports who have a similar, you know, story to tell. Yep. But 
the path to get it out there, man, is the path right. that thwarts a lot of people. Right. And sometimes you need, and my vision is, you know, to help people really from every part of the, of the aspect as far as like making the outline for your book and decide what mm. you want to talk about. All the uh -huh. way to your book signing. I want to, I want to <laughs> process because I love it. It'd be hard to like, you know, and in my case, I just kind of naturally spit my book out. I started writing really in like October of 2018. I think around April and May is when I was done with it, but I spent out uh -huh. 39 pages. So just to help people, because some people need you to stay on them. So sure, you know, like some person and says, they're like, this, I'll pay you just to make sure I'm writing some every day. Like, so some people yeah. need a service to help them do that. You know, not just publish a book, but get you through the book and get you writing the book. And then on the back end, helping out with getting it published and getting the cover done and, and just sure. think about things as such as like my cover, I wanted something catchy, so if you look at the picture on my cover, there are some different elements in that cover that talk mm -hmm. about the different chapters. So just like things right. like that to keep in mind, and then the whole marketing aspect, which you and I can see, you know, marketing is really probably the hardest part of the whole process. It is, man. But, really but, 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 really, but there's know? a lot of different platforms you have now at yeah. your disposal, right? right. And it's, it's, really about, it's really about diligence, and it's about desire. Right. And so you have to take your diligence and your desire and the opportunity, which is before, you know, these different platforms and put all those elements together, man, and just keep working it and just got to be committed. You got to say, look, this is not going to happen overnight. And for most people, it just does not happen overnight. It does. We see the after for a lot of people, man, but we don't see the grind that led up to that. So yeah. for me, man, um, you know, I have an organization that works with youth called Manhood Camp. Okay. Uh, and, and, and under that, we have Fatherhood Circle, which I'm starting to concentrate more on working with fathers. Okay. Uh, we have a monthly fatherhood support group that we do out here in California. I'm about to expand that a little bit mm -hmm. because one of the things that I learned and we talked about was the importance of being in a room mm -hmm. with people who you share a similar story to and where you can be open about that. I talk in my book, man, for me, the most important thing I think that got me through was the fact that I had the opportunity to be in rooms with people that I can, I could come out of my state of desperation, right. right? And so for me, keeping those groups going is something important. And what we should talk about, which we will talk about, is doing something on a bi-coastal thing, man, getting some sort of really cool fatherhood summit going yep. where we can bring, you know, men together where we can talk about these very difficult subjects to talk about, yep. right? And be as honest as you as I, both you and I were in this process, right? right? Cause that, and that honesty is not, we're, we're, we're looking at each other, yep. but realizing that who's ever seeing us, yep. <laughs> you know, they're seeing this, these moments of real strong vulnerability, man. So, so that's all I have to say, man. I don't know if you have any closing words, but you got um, brother. I guess I can just close by saying, just like you said earlier, it's just about release. So, you know, we talk about a lot of men could come there and they'll probably release things that they haven't really said to anybody. Absolutely. You know, as, men, as men, we just, you know, especially as black men, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of we hold in. Yeah. You know? And sometimes we hold it in for different reasons. We can hold it in because of family. Uh, right. So we don't let things out. So that's actually pretty good. And hopefully that this live, and I plan on hopefully I can find a way to download it and put it on my different media. Yeah, you can. You, you can. you can put it up or it stays up for like a day or so. So Okay, yeah. I'm going to try to find yeah. a way to download it if I can. Oh, download it. Get up to say, yeah. I think that's important, man, because people should see this. So once again, man, we should just let people know. You can get my book on uh, Amazon. If the link is in my bio. My Daughter's Keeper. Brother, where can they see yours? Where can they get it? You can get it at floydstory.com. You can also get it at Amazon. I have a paperback <laughs> and the Kindle version and... The audio book will be coming soon. I've been talking about that since the summer, but <laughs> that's a whole nother live video. But uh, right now the paperback is on Amazon, Floyd's story, a letter to Delilah, and also the Kindle version is out there as well for those who prefer that. All right. All right, brother. This has been a, a blessing, brother. I'm <laughs> glad we did this. Yeah. Uh, we, we're going to re recalibrate soon yeah. and get on Facebook Live. But yeah. now, man, I feel blessed that I had the opportunity, Floyd, to really share this yeah. platform which and i'm not just saying that in a hollywood way even though i'm out in hollywood i'm yeah. saying that very sincere as a st louis brother <laughs> that, that yeah. i really enjoyed this platform with you man it was I'm a blessing you. thank you and I, I appreciate that as well i appreciate you taking the time on a saturday for us to, to talk about this because um, i know i love it 
And, uh, you know, we'll continue to, of course, be in touch. And hopefully we can do more. We deal, will, man. Bring more people in and, and you know, just keep it going. Keep it going, brother. Right. Good. That's the motto. Keep it going. Right. And the Co-Parenting Collective and everybody else that tuned in, really appreciate your comments. Absolutely. And um, definitely your page, co the co parents Collective. I I've seen your posts and everything. So thanks for mm -hmm. supporting us uh, and Fatherhood Circle. So um, I think that's all I have, man. I'm, I guess I'll let you go. I appreciate it. And we're going to do this again soon. Absolutely, brother. Take care, man. All right, you too. All right.